I have to be blunt honest with you, I have a total of zero episodes of The Last Kingdom under my belt. It was scary going into the movie that is the logical byproduct of a 46 episode TV series that has apparently done pretty well for itself. Am I ready? Am I even invited to a party? Or am I green? Oh, I'm super green. I'm super green. Hey, I'm Robin, I love history, but I'm better at watching movies, so here we talk about historical film and TV. If you're interested in the review of The Last Kingdom, Seven Kings Must Die, from a perspective of unlooped audience member, let's roll. I expected the story to take me into the British Isles during the long war between Saxon and Dane invaders, and unravel the events that directly followed the death of the Anglo-Saxon King Edward. All of that I knew would culminate in the great battle of Brunnerbur between Athelstan, the King of England at the time, and the opposing kings of the Norse who were reluctant to accept his ways and authority. Well, from the first opening credits I knew right away I'm in the right place, and in general, I have to say, I got everything I came in for but at a very painful price. The movie takes on itself to tell a pretty extensive story with a lot of characters to keep an eye on, and it seemed like it struggles with it right off the bat. And even though acting across the board is good, I found it challenging to get attached to our poster boy and his teammates. But luckily, Athelstan grew fairly quickly on me, even without the beard. And for me, he turned out to be the main hero of the story and probably the only one with an emotional arc. Of course, Alexander Draymond does a great job as Uhtred. He knows the character inside out. But Uhtred himself doesn't change throughout the movie that much. He starts as the voice of reason helping out and pretty much ends up in the same place. And please feel free to disagree with me. I think Alexander Draymond is a good actor, but I don't buy him as a Viking warrior. He's way too handsome. If Brad Pitt and Luke Evans had a baby, it could have been Uhtred. But Robin, Travis Fiennes is a former model. Yes, Travis is a handsome dude too, but in my eyes he's ruggedly handsome especially as Ragnar Lothbrok, and there is a difference. And that goes for the cast in general. Many look like they've seen too few winters and just stepped off the pages of the fashion magazine. The young and clean faces just shine as a well-polished silverware and stand out against the gray, gritty and wet landscape of medieval England, which is done pretty well, by the way, but immersion, broken. Luckily, every time that happened, the music was the one that pulled me back in. It is of the right kind and kicks in exactly when the story needs it and backs away when it doesn't. Cinematography is solid, fight choreography is good, Battle on Brunnenburg is fantastic, in my opinion, we'll get to it. And Edward Bazalget, as a director, does his job very well, so visually the story sells. But I have a problem with how the film treats its audience. To me, it seems like it separates it in two different camps, the smart ones, who are fans of the TV series who don't need explaining and developing the characters to them, and the others who just have to emphasize those characters, well, just because. Am I supposed to jizz in my pants just by looking at Uhtred's sword? Then clearly it means a lot to him, but to me it's just a sword with an amber gem in the pommel. And as a Baltic-born, I love amber, but not happening. The dialogue doesn't help either. Actually, it treats both sides of the audience as dum-dums, either explaining what we just saw on screen or confirming the same action twice. I already know you're going to Wessex. I already know you're going to see that person. Just tell me something personal, how you missed their farts or something. Same goes for the prophecy Seven Kings Must Die. Not a spoiler here because, trust me, don't expect much of it. Some Viking lady I have never met just casually says it around the table that she had a dream about it, repeats it later one more time for a good measure, and that's it. Do you trust a stranger that sits next to you at the pub and claims to be a prophet? I hope not. And if the Rings of Power invented teleportation, this film perfected it. Before you can even blink, a bunch of the characters will jump from one part of the British Isles to another and back. And some of them will just randomly pop up in the frame whenever it's convenient. I call it, oh, hi Mark moment for those who've seen The Room of the Disaster Artist. So all of that makes the middle part of the story a big untrustworthy, rushed mess. Around 120-ish, I was in vain. But I endured, because I knew the Battle of Brunnenberg is coming. And not in vain. It is one of those on-screen experiences that gets you on the inside of the warrior ranks and almost into their minds through the properly set anticipation. Some liberties are taken in terms of numbers for the dramatic effect, because historically both armies were about the same size, but it doesn't matter, because it comes across as raw and unfiltered, unglorified portrayal of medieval bloodshed. Shield wall and shield wall, fear in the eyes, sweat, piss, vomit, and lots and lots of pushing. Fun fact, 
The most descriptive source of information remains the poem Battle of Brunnenberg from Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. It states that the battle lasted the whole day and the pursuit till sundown. Amongst the casualties were five young kings and seven earls from all of kings of Dublin army. And the defeated fled, leaving all their dead to the wildlife to feast on. Nothing glorious about it. Uhtred's pre-battle speech could have been done better. It's kind of split in two parts, but it doesn't matter because I don't think it's the main selling point anyway. There's just enough emotional involvement with some of the characters to stay engaged and the stunt and camera work wraps it all up in a very presentable gory package. Thus, I'm not gonna lie, the film didn't leave me feeling completely empty and I'm grateful for it, but the juicy part is I still think it's tailored to the die-hard fans of the respective TV series without, however, doing it any favors. And in some moments it felt to me it's pretty brutal to the fan base too. As for the rest of us, I think it's worth maybe two-thirds of Rotten Tomato ratings. I'd watch it for the really basic history points, enjoy the battle and forget about it. Thank you so much for sticking around, I'll see you in the next one.